good evening all uh, we will start with a silent prayer just one minute silence <laughs> thank you actually it gives me great pleasure that uh, we are the our association is organizing this webinar this is the third in the series and as antony has mentioned earlier all these uh, talks will be available in future for reference for all our uh, members and the next month's topic will be on elbow injuries by kollam orthopedic club so the talks are being finalized so i welcome you all for today's webinar thank you very much over to anthony take away audio anthony audio anthony Hello? Okay, okay. Good evening, good evening. Good evening, Valley. How are you doing? Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, all. Anthony? Hello? Antony, audio. Sorry, Antony, sir, no audio can do issue. Or can you not? Sir, we are chatting and carry on. Hello. 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 Anthony. Sir, Anthony, sir, no audio can do issue under. That is work here, nila. Sir, sir, carry. Sir, start. Did he do a number? Did he do a number? Okay, Jiju. Uh, good evening, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, respected Kerala uh, President Dr. Ramachan, Secretary Dr. Anthony, and my dear friends, and Madhya Madhya Kerala Orthopedic Society Secretary and President. I am grateful that uh, the third webinar series is conducted by uh, Madhya Pradesh Orthopedic Society, and uh, and more happy since my Rajiv, uh, who was with me in uh, Toronto Medical College, is giving one topic or uh, speaking spe spe speaker in this uh, webinar also, and the most interesting topic. I wish all the best for the uh, series. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Yes, yes, sir. Ah, uh, yeah, you can have an introductory uh -huh. remark. Okay, uh, this is a very auspicious occasion for the Madhyamal Orthopedic Club. So this webinar series has been running very successfully as far as I know, and this is very uh, good initiative from the KOA office. And uh, really, hats off to Ramosh and team for starting this webinar and uh, and uh, and this is uh, and continuing with a, a good uh, motto. So today's topic we prepared for the uh, this webinar is patch leg of femur. I think uh, this is a very useful and a very common problem with all of us. So and uh, speakers for this program is also uh, very eminent and uh, uh, very good. Uh, you all know personally and uh, professionally. I wish them all and uh, welcome to Madhyamal Orthopedic Club webinar. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, today's speakers are Dr. Murali Krishnan, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Srijit, and Dr. Murigan Babu. And uh, I think um, Dr. Murali is going to moderate the session. Over to you, Murali Krishnan. Uh, thank you, sir. But I, I don't know that I'm moderating. I'm the first speaker. Uh, I don't. Know. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. 
welcome to all a good mom warm good evening to all my dear teachers and my dear friends it's a auspicious occasion to be here uh, education is always the best way to move forward in profession so we have a good topic here fracture neck of femur shall i uh, share my screen yeah yes, the yes, office yes. arun yes sir yes, sir kana ah hmm. can you see yeah it's coming only yes yes running coming no yes 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 okay. yes yes okay. thank you so um, visible to all yeah if it is visible to all then i will start i will without any much of further ado because we have a uh, yes, time timing yes, yes. uh, please carry on yeah thank you comprehensive applied vascular anatomy femoral head why it is so important is because uh, we find that why some cases of valgus impacted neck of femurs go into avascular necrosis and why some cases of displaced fracture neck of femurs do not have avascular necrosis what is the difference between a simple dislocation of the hip and a complex fracture dislocation of the hip in terms of them getting avascular necrosis so the knowledge of the vascular anatomy is paramount importance for any orthopedic surgeon who deals with neck of femur whether it is for the conservative management or for close reduction and fixation of fractures or for open reduction or for um doing procedures like gans osteotomy for further complicated procedures i work here what we know we know that the arteries that supply the pelvis and the hip are the profunda femoris the obturator the superior gluteal and the inferior gluteal we know that the medial circumflex femoral artery and the lateral circumflex femoral artery form a ring around the trochanter and they supply the neck and the uh, femoral head branches we know that the ligament and teres is formed from the obturator artery also we know in children based on the age there is a very huge large blood vessel supply with large diameters less than 4 years and uh, all these vessels have got good diameter and uh, there is no barrier between the head and the neck from 4 to 8 years we know there is epiphyseal plate more than 8 years we know that the ligament and teres artery also joins in circulation but we also know from this picture if you can see this picture clearly you can see a inter in, uh, circumtrochanteric ring from which vessels are going inside and they are going into the femoral head now we need to know much much more than this that is the importance of this topic we need to know where exactly what is happening and we need to know where we can cut for example if we have a uh, hematoma of the intracapsular hematoma due to fracture neck of femur where exactly can you put a knife to decompress the hematoma if at all you want to decompress if you want to open the capsule to do a plating or a open reduction of the neck of femur where will you open without compromising the vascular anatomy this is a very good paper by gans anatomy of the medial circumflex femoral artery and the surgical implications now these are all very very beautiful papers and uh, my i i uh, respect them for this the topographical anatomy of the mcfa or the medial circumflex femoral artery comes from it from comes from anterior runs between the femur and pelvis and supplies the femoral head from posterior so i am going to dissect this anatomy layer by layer so that we understand it beautifully by the end of the presentation so it starts anteriorly from the femoral artery and then runs between the femur and pelvis and supplies the femoral artery from posterior let us go little more deep the origin is from the deep femoral artery it between the iliopsoas and the pectineus anteriorly and then at the level of the uh, get a lesser trochanter or get a trochanter and from there it runs a retrograde course back to the femoral head that is how it supplies the femoral head the femoral artery uh, the femoral head now see here the most important muscle that is associated with the mcfa is not the quadratus femoris it is the obturator externus we have to have take home points whenever we have a presentation or a topic this is one of the first take home points from here the obturator externus muscle 
carries on its posterior surface the medial circumflex femoral artery so if you see this uh, um, uh, profunda femoris that is the mcfa coming and there you can see it running towards the head and so the operator externus can you see the pointer working is working so the operator externus it carries the mcfa now let us go to the next layer originally from the deep femoral artery between the iliopsoas and pectineus then it gives a branch for the inferior retinaculum and that is called the ligament of vibrate now ligament of vibrate is a very important structure which we need to understand and then it posterior it towards the femoral intertrochanteric crest crosses over the externus posteriorly gives a trochanteric branch and under the triceps cause which anterior to the triceps what is triceps cause these two gamellae and the obturator internus so how do we understand that now here is a group good picture which shows the greater trochanter and there is the pelvis here you can see the piriformis short external rotators the obturator externus and the cortical femoris the femoral from the femoral artery the mcfa comes here it has a transverse course then it ascends when it ascends it goes posterior to the obturator externus and dips at the short external rotator and then goes anterior to the short external rotators uh, above the capsule to enter the uh, femoral head there it gives the trochanteric branch also i think it is visible to all of you with the pointer also so there are three parts the transverse segment the ascending mfca and the deep mfca now we have to understand this because we are all posterior hip surgeons and we open the hip always posteriorly most of the time and this is what we under uh, see or don't see now we'll go a little more deep you can see here the cortical femoris is in place there is the greater trochanter a trochanteric branch is there and you can see the mcfa being held by a forceps now if i remove the uh, cortical femoris you can find it very clearly the mcfa is running a transverse course ascending course dips inside the short external rotators to go anteriorly to the neck of the femur now here you can see once again very clearly the obturator external tendon and the ascending branch of the mfca now these all dissected specimens with dye uh, tell us a lot about the actual anatomy now we can see a beautiful inferior retinal artery also here i'll come to that later now this is the uh, ct angiogram once again we now know what we are seeing that is the mcfa so there are five consistent branches for the mfca the superficial the ascending acetabular descending and deep we are concerned about the deep branch that is what is giving these trochanteric branches now we have got anastomosis around the hip now this anastomosis is very very important the anastomosis is between the mfca and the other other arteries there we know that there is anastomosis around the trochanter and then we, uh, in, the, we have a peripheral anastomosis and this anastomosis this one the inferior gluteal artery with the deep branch of the mfca is a very important anastomosis it has been studied very well and found to be a savior of those cases where the actual mfca gets injured in neck of femur fracture this amount of variations are there in the mfca which are not to be noted in the anatomical dissected specimens now what is the applied anatomy of what we told till now we have got the posterior approach the greater trochanter is there the gluteus medius is there gemella is there so where do you exactly incise the short axis rotators from the gt the answer is 15 to 20 mm from the gt because the mcfa courses very close to the gt at that level here so this circle oval circle is the place where the mcfa crosses so we have to avoid it and preserve it how do we do that we elevate the uh, muscles from 20 mm away from the gt and then we elevate them off the capsule when we do that we are going to preserve the mcfa and obturator externus is not to be cut so that is a very important thing for a hip surgeon we sometimes we end up cutting the obturator externus also try to preserve the obturator externus try to take the piriformis and the gamellae or the um, uh, conjoint tendon alone so there is a striking difference in the reported rate of avn after uncompleted dislocation and fracture dislocation of the hip why it is 11 percentage for uncomplicated dislocation and 31 for the um, fracture dislocation so why 
the answer is being this was a beautiful paper and it was dissected that in many cases the obturatory externus muscle if it is left intact and if all the other muscles are cut piriformis superior gamelae inferior gamelae obturatory internus even cordatus femoris this preserved the vascular anatomy of this head because it carried the mcfa on its posterior aspect so in those simple dislocations we find that the obturatory externus muscle is not ruptured whereas in a fracture dislocation of the femur there is a high propensity for the obturatory externus to get ruptured so that is a very important take home now we go to the next layer we are dissecting deep what is the retinacula of with brick in the adult head this was the original uh, picture by in 1742 as old as 1742 and then people dissected this and this is what we know there are retinacular ramifications of the capsule once you excise the capsule the superficial layer it has got some foldings these foldings are one the anterior retinaculum where it is the, 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 this can you see this fold this fold is i think it's appreciable the next one is the medial retinaculum you can see the medial retinaculum this medial retinaculum if you see very clearly it is standing somewhat away from the neck there is a small tunnel which you can see in between the medial retinaculum and the neck we'll come to that later now the lateral retinaculum lateral retinaculum is a very very dense structure and it is uh, closely associated with the superior or the lateral aspect of the neck now what do these three retinaculums do why they are important they are important because they contain the retinacular arteries the retinacular arteries of three in number one is postero superior or lateral and the postero inferior or medial and their inconsistent anterior branch so main arterial supply for the neck of femur is from the postero superior and postero inferior branches so here we are seeing for example this is the lateral retinaculum if you can see very clearly that contains the lateral retinaculum once you remove the lateral retinaculum you find all the subsynovial branch, uh, retinacular arteries they are dyed blue and see it very clearly they are opposed very close to the neck so this is very very important so what is the importance of this the importance is the maximum amount of uh, blood supply comes to the neck of femur from the posterior superior retinacular artery which is a branch of the deep branch of the medial circumflex femoral artery now you can see here once again the branches going and once they finish their neck course they dip into the subchondral area of the femoral head and there they form the nutrient foramen so they have become the nutrient arteries of the femoral head there are multiple nutrient arteries of femoral head right now here you can see the inferior aspect of the uh, head which means the medial aspect there you can see a inferior retinacular artery we first talked about the posterior superior artery this is the posterior inferior artery see how beautifully it is it's a long branch it has been dissected very well and is going into the subchondral bone and it is staying away from the neck why it is staying away from the neck we will come to that later now we'll go now one more layer deep what is the distribution of nutrient foramina within the femoral head this is a very important paper this fame paper very clearly showed that the nutrient foramina are mainly seen in the posterior superior or the lateral aspect of the neck and then on the medial aspect and not on the anterior aspect so it is very clear medial circumflex artery forms the deep branch the deep branch gives posterior superior posterior inferior arteries they travel along the lateral retinaculum and the medial retinaculum of vitbrek and they uh, run through the neck they enter the femoral head through the nutrient foramina which are in the same place as the retinaculum so these capsular ramifications called retinaculae carry the arteries now we will read this sentence clearly both the mfca and the lfca give off branches from the joint capsule at the base of femoral neck when passing through the retinacula of vitbrek to the femoral head and neck so this um, sentence was greek and latin to me until i understood these things so now it is very clear as most nutritive arteries run through the retinaculum knowledge of the location is very very important so what is the importance arthrotomy performed on the anterior surface of femoral neck never compromises the vascularization of the femoral head so if you want to open the capsule open the capsule along a 125 degree cone from the anterior aspect up to the 0 to 6 o'clock not in the posterior aspect in contrast if you put a home and elevator between the capsule and the upper surface of the femoral nerve 
uh, if the assistant is over enthusiastic he is going to damage your femoral neck blood supply now the same applies to nailing when the entry point is located on the upper surface of the femoral nerve now let us see that is the capsulotomy say it's a vessel preserving surgical hip dislocation and uh, here you can see a t shaped capsulotomy on the anterior aspect here you can clearly see this in this picture that the this picture that shows the femoral neck that the anterior surface is purely devoid of blood supply and whenever you do a gans osteotomy the sh shaped capsulotomy it is a, a very standard operation we all know he opens posteriorly and then goes anteriorly and opens the capsule anteriorly because the hip blood supply could be preserved only then now nailing in adolescence what is the next applied anatomy you can see that the superior retinacular vessels stay very close to the piriform fossa in adolescence so if you go on nailing them and if you are not good in your technique you are going to destroy the, uh, uh, the blood supply and if at all you are going to escape by nailing then please put the end cap uh, if you are using a good nail because the end cap will allow you to dissect very less when you are removing the nail because after one and a half years of fracture fixation avian is not necessary so using an owl at the piriform fossa in children requiring im fixation of their femur fracture may endanger the blood supply and cause av in the femoral neck now here very clearly it is seen the retinacula and the piriform fossa <clears throat> so to conclude medial secondary femoral artery is a dominant supply in all ages identify the trochanteric branch to locate the mcfa preserve the obturator externus and the cordatus femoris incise the conjoint tendon and piriformis tendon 15 to 20 mm from their insertions posterior superior and posterior inferior retinaculum of widbred carry a lot of importance in understanding uh, for a good surgeon and anterior approach to the hip is safer also the mcfa anatomy is key to success in hip preservation thank you hello sir uh, thank you murli that was a very nice presentation and i think all our delegates are benefited we'll go on to the next uh, topic Yeah, I think it's by Rajiv. Hello. So you can start sharing and sharing your ah. screen. Ah, uh, Rajiv, over to Rajiv. Hello. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, respected teachers, seniors, and dear friends. first of all i thank koa and mkoc for giving me this opportunity when you think about the reconstruction of neck of femur so many things come to your mind the first one is its precarious blood supply which is already well dealt by dr murli and during our mbbs days we were taught that neck of femur is devoid of cambium layer and there are so many inhibiting factors in the uh, synovial fluid which will prevent the fracture to unite and when we start fixing there are so many things the one is avian there are high chances of implant failure and when we choose the implants there are so many options like cancellous screws dhs and fns so let's see what the literature says still the old classification systems of the garden and powell are valid when you consider the fracture patterns when in fixing the fracture there are two major fracture patterns one the first one is the valgus with impaction and the second one is varus with apex anterior deformity and possible posterior okay. combination have you have you started your screen sharing it's not yes, sir. no screen uh, we are not screen not at visible not visible yeah yeah sir Just a minute. Share screen on the chat. Okay. Zoom in. That's the point. Share screen. Wait a minute. Share screen. Is it visible? Yeah. 
Yeah, please go. Hello, Rajiv. Hey, sir, just a minute. Yeah. yeah, take your time. Take your time. Is it visible? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sorry for the inconvenience. Mm, no problem. When you uh, plan for fixation, there are two major factor patterns are into consideration. The first one is the valgus with impaction, and the second one is fracture with virus, apex anterior deformity, and posterior combination. In valgus impacted fractures, there is no much of controversy. At any age, the option is fixation with implants and in virus with apex anterior angulation, retroversion deformity and posterior combination. If the age is more than 65, straight away you can opt for a arthroplasty, which will be dealt by Murgensar later. And the, if the age is less than 65, it's better to fix it. And uh, when I talk about the age 65, it's better to consider the physiological age rather than the chronological age. If the patient is in his 50s with multiple comorbidities like advanced cardiac, uh, uh, poor cardiac function or uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, it's better for go for a one definitive procedure rather than going for multiple procedures if the fracture fixation fails. And in valgus impacted fractures, they are inherently stable. You can straight away fix it with a cancellous screw and you can use a fully threaded screws in the inferior neck to prevent further collapse. And the fracture with varus deformity, apex anterior angulation and posterior combination, the controversy is here. First of all, you have to get a proper x-ray. The x-rays from the emergency department are always suboptimal because there are so many limiting factors like proximal femoral osteopenia, the overlying bony and soft tissue anatomy, the beam angulation may be suboptimal, so the proper AP and axial view may not be available. Sometimes there may be over or under penetration, and sometimes due to uh, pain, the patient positioning may not be correct. So always reconfirm the uh, images in the theater under anesthesia, and then only uh, proceed. If you find that the fracture is not amenable for fixation, straight away you can opt for arthroplasty. If you choose the advanced imaging techniques like CT scan, in 70% of the valgus impacted fractures, there is actually an extension through the medial cortex. So uh, X-rays act are actually deceiving us. And if you sub uh, subject all the valgus impacted fractures into uh, for a CT scan, 70% of the cases are having medial cortex fracture. So uh, based on uh, pure based on valgus impacted uh, fractures based on x-ray, uh, the treatment decision can change. And 21% of cases which we uh, decided to fix with um, based on the x-ray imaging will be changed after CT uh, scanning. So uh, CT will give additional uh, inputs and you can have a better knowledge of the fracture anatomy rather than just believing on the x-rays. MRI won't give any additional advantage but MRIs are very sensitive in detecting occult fractures. If you are still doubtful whether there is any fracture or not, MRIs are uh, having a good advantage, but it doesn't give any extra advantage over CT scan because it is time consuming and or it is more costlier. So MRI doesn't give any extra advantage whether to, uh, to decide upon whether we need a fixation or not. Once you find that the fracture is ready for fixation, you have to reduce the fracture before fixing. You can first of all try the close reduction techniques, which can be either in extension like the classic Whitman technique or in flexion like Ledbetter technique. There are so many fix, uh, reduction techniques are available. You can find after reduction, you can confirm the reduction with a heel pump test. If the uh, heel pump test it shows still the fracture in external rotation. You can uh, try one more time. Repeated attempts of close reduction will uh, compromise the vascularity. So it's better not to 
go for multiple items then it's better to go for open reduction rather than continuing repeated multiple items if the closed reduction fails you can try for a mini open technique and you can try joysticking the fracture with cables you can uh, rotate the fracture fragments with the shan spin or you can use a bone hook or you can even use small clamps to reduce the fracture if still the fracture is unreduced you have to open the fracture already murli sir said anti wrap approach is safe so you can use either a watson jones anti lateral approach or a smith peterson approach if you use a watson jones approach the you can fix the fracture through the same incision and if you are choosing the smith peterson approach you need another second incision laterally for putting the implants next controversy is whether you want uh, you have to disembag the fracture before fixing that's mainly for the valgus impacted fractures if the if you fix the fracture in um, valgus impacted position there will be definitely malunion and that will alter the hip offset and that will cause the short, cause a shortening of the neck and definitely there will be decrease in the abductor liver arm and the hip function will be poor if you disembag the fracture there are positives you have to you can restore the anatomy you can improve the implant positioning because in a retroverted head if you place a screw in the center of the neck will end up in the anterior aspect of the head so there is high chance of implant penetration anteriorly if the fracture fails to unite what are the negatives of disembagging the fracture it definitely destabilizes the fracture and that will give extra additional stress on the implant once you reduce the fracture you have to confirm it under uh, fluoroscopy there are multiple assessment techniques the one simplest one is the lavels s curves if the reduction is uh, perfect you can see a smooth s curves over the neck and head both in ap and axial views and if the reduction is not proper you will see broken c curves on the ap and lateral views and also you can use the garden's alignment index and the another index is posterior tilt angle that is a line drawn through the center of the femoral neck is that is called the mcl which is shown in this figure that is called a middle column line and you draw another circle around the femoral head and from the center of that circle draw a line to the first line that is mcl that is called the radial column line the angle subtend between these two lines is that uh, uh, angle called alpha that is called the posterior tilt angle if the angle is more than 20 degree after reduction there is high chance of failure then coming to the implant of choice currently in india what we use are cancellous screws dhs with derotation screws and femoral neck system and in the previous days there are move spins knoll spins and watson jones nail which are not currently in use coming to the cantilated cancellous screws it is placed in inverted triangle uh, shape it gives three point fixation one in the head one in the neck and in the lateral cortex and always when you uh, fix with a cancellous screw the inferior screw should rest on the endosteum of the inferior neck to prevent a varus collapse and the posterior sh screw should uh, rest on the posterior cortex to prevent the posterior neck to prevent the retroversion collapse it is not devoid of any complications the fixation failure chances are around 19% varying from uh, powell 1 2 3 and uh, avian and non union is around 11% in multiple literatures revision rates are around 16% it doesn't give any angular stability but it gives good rotational stability the advantages are it's of low cost it can be done percutaneously it gives good rotational stability and the bleeding is very less and operating time is very less and radiation exposure also very less there are some modifications uh, to prevent or <coughs> to adjust about this angular stability the one given by all in filippo this is called the biplane double supported screw fixation the same three screws are oriented in Di uh, three medially diverging directions, and two screws will support the medial calcar. And the one screw which is placed from the 
distally from the shaft in an obtuse angle supports the medial calcar and the posterior neck and another screw that is the brown screw and the another screw which is in blue color it again supports the calcar in 130 degree so two calcar supporting screws in variable directions variable angle 165 and 130 degree and one screw supports the posterior the same calcar supporting screw one supports the posterior uh, neck and one supports the anterior neck so it supports the neck uh, both in both planes and also support calcar in with two screws in two planes so it gives good rotational and angular stability then another modification is powell screw apart from the classical three screws in inverted triangular shape it give uh, an additional screw is placed perpendicular to the fracture that is called the powell screw which gives angular stability multiple uh, literature has shown that these bdsf and powell screw give good results and another one is medial calcar femoral plating adding a plate on the medial side in a powell three type of fracture will convert the shearing forces in the neck into compressive forces so it will help to help the fractures to unite with the uh, simple cancellous screws again back to the anatomy already uh, murli sir dealt it very well this inferior retinacular arteries which are the branches of the mmca are very important because already the superior vessels murli sir actually uh, told in between this inferior retinacular uh, uh, retinacula is actually somewhat lifted away from the neck and superior retinacular vessels are actually pasted over the neck so when the fracture get uh, when the neck get fractured usually the superior retinacular vessels will get damaged then only the inferior retina retinacular vessels will be retained because superior retinacula is closely attached to the uh, neck it will get damaged the inferior only remaining vascularity is actually the inferior retinacular artery and actually these vessels when they are according to certain studies these inferior retinacular arteries are actually supplying the superior weight bearing dome so once you damage these inferior retinacular arteries there is high chance of avian in the superior articulating area so placing plate on the in just anterior to that is in the 5 o'clock 6 o'clock position just anterior to the uh, lesser trochanter is the safest portion and by putting such a plate on, that is usually a 130 tubular plate and uh, unicortical uh, screws applied on the neck and head can prevent uh, varus collapse and can convert the shearing forces into compressive forces and again coming to the old dhs with d rotation screw literature shown that there is no advantage of over putting an additional d rotation screw rather than it prevents uh, rotation actually dhs give good angular stability and the another rotation anti rotation screw gives rotational stability but it doesn't give any clinical advantage of, by just putting a dhs rather than adding another screw coming to the newer system the femoral neck system it, it has uh, so many advantages only disadvantage is the cost and it doesn't give any uh, torque while putting this uh, screw because all other dhs and screws uh, will give torque on the neck which can again compress the vessels so putting a, a fns there is no insertional torque it is very compact it can be uh, placed with a smaller incision and operating time is also very uh, less and it can be safely placed in a patient with very narrow neck uh, in some cases we cannot place three screws and cancellous screws in the neck in such cases this fns is very useful and it gives very high resistance to varus collapse and it doesn't protrude uh, outside the lateral cortex so it won't give any implant irritation once the fracture gets uh, collapsed there are novel fixation implants which are uh, available in the western markets the one like targon by b brown and concus by smith and nephew the literature shows that they had good results uh, very low non union and avian rates and less revision rates but uh, it needs multi multi centric long term trials what about the tamponade effect literature varies some says uh, it gives good result and some says 
there is no advantage of uh, uh, aspirating the hematoma or doing capsulotomy and relieving the hematoma but if you are planning to go for uh, uh, decompressing the tamponade effect by a capsulotomy always do it uh, uh, only on the anterior aspect because already merle said said oh, um, more <coughs> vascularity comes through the posterior aspect and anterior part anterior capsule is devoid of much blood vessels so if you are planning to do an capsulotomy do it anteriorly and if you are not planning to do a capsulotomy you can aspirate the hematoma with a white bore needle what about the timing of surgery always uh, uh, surgery done within 6 hours of trauma gives better results less avian rates less non union rates and augmentation with calcium phosphate or bone cement there is no extra advantage and in almost uh, 66% of cases fixed with the ccs and dhs there is femoral neck shortening and definitely that will decrease the hip function and 15 degree valgus will cause 10 degree decrease in abductor momentum so the major disadvantage of dhs and ccs is femoral neck shortening which can be prevented with a femoral neck system because the collapse is very less in femoral neck system and coming to the faith trial both in cancellous screws and uh, dhs the revision rates are almost equal so uh, no one is uh, superior and what are the reasons to fail insufficient reduction varus implant positioning a uh, posterior tilt of more than 20 degree or anterior tilt of more than 10 degree and femoral head cartilage perforation while doing the fixation what about the valgus osteotomy and muscle pedicle graft it is not considered as a primary option if the primary surgery fails you can opt for a valgus osteotomy or a muscle pedicle graft to conclude the mainstay in osteosynthesis of neck of femur fracture is the technique of achieving good reduction and maintaining it it cannot be compensated with a implant chosen whether you choose a cancellous screw fns or dhs the reduction should be proper and try to maintain it with a proper implant rather than choosing a costlier implant by compromising a poor reduction it will not give good result thank you thank you dr rajiv for the nice presentation think it's open for discussion if anyone has any doubts or questions regarding the fixation options i think we can go for a, a short discussion i have one question for you dr rajiv sir um in all the cases you may not be able to place the three screws as described in the textbooks so if you are stopping with two screws how would you prefer the two screws one on the uh, calcar that is the inferior one on the posterior side okay definitely so calcar screw is very important to maintain the to prevent the further collapse isn't it main fixation failure is due to varus collapse and uh, retroversion deformity so to prevent both one on the uh, calcar one on the posterior uh, posterior neck sometimes the neck is in uh, indian females the neck is very uh, and narrow you cannot uh, place two screws also if the valgus impacted fractures if you are not disimpacting it there will be difficulty in placing three screws because the fracture is already in retroversion you cannot place three screws especially the superior two screws Uh, Raji, one question. So, yeah. in the inferior aspect of the neck, you the, the inferior screw, whether it is a fully threaded screw or a partly threaded screw, uh, getting in a uh, purchase on the the uh, the, this, the neck of on the head only. So, there are different um, uh, pictures. We also showed two pictures: one with the fully threaded screws and one X-ray showing only partly threaded. So, which is the concept? Current concept. Uh, there are uh, so many papers from israel they did uh, so many uh, research and they uh, said that fully threaded screws prevent varus collapse but actually the fracture unite with collapse if there is good contact at the time of fixation it's better uh, choose a fully threaded screw and if there is still a, there is a gap if you choose a uh, fully threaded screw there is no uh, space for it to collapse so definitely it may fail so if the fracture is well compressed at the time of uh, well reduced there is no gap on the calcar you can use a fully threaded cancellous screw if there is some amount of gap 
definitely it should collapse uh, for union by placing a fully threaded screw will prevent uh, fracture collapse that's what i learned from that literature from the israel prefer uh, uh, paper sir uh, can I, can i just add yeah sir, please one, one small point uh, we have seen in many cases of fracture fixations with three neck three uh, partial threaded cancel screws that at one to two months of time three months of time there is some amount of uh, removal of the screw from the lateral aspect of the uh, femur that happens because even after good fixation there will be more collapse that is happening while the fracture is uniting so the concept of this fully threaded screw is just to prevent full collapse it just to have a controlled collapse as rajiv said if there is good contact at the time of this thing even then if you put one full threaded screw and two partial screws they will serve their purpose at the time of fixation and also after the fixation to prevent further collapse so it's a controlled collapse mechanism but uh, will a fully threaded screw prevent uh, collapse and uh, is there a tendency for it to go in for non union sir yeah, there is chance there is chance for the uh, the fully threaded screw to go in for non union especially in combination so i think the uh, most of the western literature papers uh, say that you should use an, a fully threaded screw to prevent collapse so that the medial offset will be maintained the abductor lurch will not occur but we are more concerned about the fracture union i think if you put a, a, a fully threaded screw it will uh, probably in most of the cases it may unite but chances of in non union is high with the fully threaded screw but since we so are sir, concerned, uh, so sir we uh, i actually make the concept of using the two principles together as you said sir we use the fixation only with partial threaded screws the fully threaded screw is only put just to prevent further collapse that's all so what is no, when, the so yeah i think uh, we I reduce know. the reduce the fracture with a partial threaded screw get a good contact get a good reduction and then one screw will be fully threaded which is put last okay the fracture should be in contact fracture end should be in, in contact that's the most that's the most okay and another question uh, rajiv regarding this uh, plating do we have any dedicated implant for this uh, plating of the neck andromedial neck and actually i don't have any personal experience uh, of doing femoral neck uh, plating what literature uh, shares uh, shares they do use uh, one third tubular plate okay small uh, pre uh, pre cut three or four hole one third tubular plate okay either in the five o'clock or six o'clock position and the dissection should be very meticulous otherwise it will invite avian thank you dr rajiv there are no more questions we'll go on to the next topic welcome dr srijit for his talk on pediatric neck fractures dr srijit Yeah. I'm just sharing my screen. <coughs> Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yes, please. And uh what is it? and the screen visible also is yes. it yeah you can start yeah. yeah good evening everyone so uh, in this cme about uh, fracture neck of femur i am just handling the 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 pediatric part fracture neck of femur in children so uh Uh, why why so much of importance is given to this fracture especially in children it it comprises of uh, less than 1% of fractures in children but still it it causes lot of complications that in some papers the 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 rate of complications are up to 50% half of the patients they uh, sustain some form of a, an adverse event and most of the complications they are they can in such a way that they can be down to lifelong disability and like uh, uh how dr murali has described here also the the uh, anatomy is important 
compared to the the fraction of femur in old age or or uh, in adults here the bone is more it is thicker and it has got an even equally thick periosteum so to break these two structures it needs very high energy trauma and again the blood supply just like in adults and an added problem also there in in kids wherein the problem of physis which acts as a barrier the the growth plate acts as a barrier of to crossing of metaphyseal arteries uh, to the epiphysis so uh, at birth uh, all the metaphyseal arteries can tra travels uh, it can travel to the uh, the epiphysis but uh, by around 4 years the physis is fully developed and it prevents uh, the metaphyseal blood supply is totally cut off so uh, this uh, the blood supply is even more tenuous in case of a child and the classification it's uh, the uh, you all will be knowing talbot classification which has been given uh, in the beginning of 20th century by talbot and it is popularized by colonna later on and it has got uh, it, it depends on the level of the fracture type 1 is transphyseal type 2 is transcervical 3 cervical trochanteric and 4 is intertrochanteric and the most common one is transcervical type 1 is again subclassified into type 1a where there is dislocation of the epi uh, where there is no dislocation of the epiphysis it is just fracture whereas the epiphysis is dislocated from the acetabulum in in case of type 1b a very difficult fracture to uh, treat and this is a very good classification there is good inter and intra observer reliability and it it it, it dictates the uh, the treatment to uh, a good extent as well as it gives the prognosis and and also uh, the rate of complications also very proportionately according to the uh, the the type fracture type and the clinical presentation the peak incidence is 10 to 13 years and it's more common in boys and it is as i have told it is due to high energy trauma like fall from height or road traffic accident if it is due to a low energy mechanism always suspected pathological fracture and the uh, main uh, investigation we need is a plain x ray of the pelvis ap or uh, or lateral view and the lateral view is cross table lateral view because it, it doesn't uh, put the fracture uh, into much strain and pain and uh, ct scan is indicated in undisplaced fractures where the x ray doesn't give uh, show the fracture and also in type 1b fractures where we can uh, locate the Uh, characterize the fragment and uh, the displaced dislocated fragment as well as uh, we can locate it an mri is indicated in, in case of pathological fractures and stress fractures and the initial treatment involves traction analgesics and uh, investigate the child especially uh, for uh, pre anesthetic uh, checkup and also for uh, diagnosing path fractures and surgical planning and getting proper implant these uh, injuries are very rare they come just uh, once in a year or maybe maybe even more uh, rare so we may not be having uh, the adequate uh, implants or or the armamentarium in our hospital so getting the proper implant keeping everything ready and and the most important thing is parental counseling because uh, of the high rate of complications and re surgeries everything Uh, counseling the patient the parents about all these things is uh, very important and again just like uh, just as uh, dr rajiv said here also in children also there is some uh, uh, lack of consensus uh, about the timing of surgery uh, since it involves a, a, a insult to the vascularity there are many people who believe that uh, it should be operated as an emergency procedure even in an odd hour but uh, the consensus i mean uh, the most of the surgeons they believe that it should be operated urgently and not as a, an emergency procedure like uh, they believe uh, it should be operated within 24 hours 
it, sh- it has to be operated early but we should have adequate uh, setup adequate implants and experience staff and surgeons should not be operated by a, an in- inexperienced this fractures should not be operated by a, an inexperienced sir then it needs expertise an aim of the surgical procedure is to get an anat- anatomical reduction and fix the fracture in a stable manner so to achieve this the the uh, first method we sh- we should always uh, uh, use is close reduction it should be uh, achieved with gentle longitudinal traction with a hip in extension internal rotation and abduction and the final slight adjustment should be uh, done to uh, achieve uh, uh, the final touch or the perfect uh, reduction and in small children we can use free hand technique but in older children we can use the fracture table as in adults and forceful and repeated manipulation should always be avoided as in adults a maximum of one or two gentle attempts at close reduction should be done after that uh, attempt uh, uh, it should be open and what is acceptable reduction in, in children less than 2 mm displacement and less than 5 degree angulation here also the literature varies but i am just putting the most uh, recommended values uh, this should be achieved in both andro ap and lateral views and if we do if we don't uh, achieve this we have to adequate reduction with close method we have to open it in type 1b fracture always go for open reduction the dislocated fragment uh, yeah, it is uh, very difficult to achieve a close reduction for the dislocated fragment and uh, pathological fracture also we have to open reduce it because we need uh, tissue for uh, the histopathological diagnosis and the approach mainly it depends on the level of the fracture delbert classification for uh, 1 2 delbert 1 2 and 3 smith peters and the anterior approach gives a very good exposure of the fracture uh, but but uh, as uh, dr rajiv said here also we need an extra an additional lateral incision for putting the implant and for the more lateral fractures like delbert 3 and 4 we can use watson jones and lateral approach hardinge approach also and again the role of caps uh, capsulotomy here also it, there is no literature support but uh, since it uh, it uh, theoretically decompresses the joint and decreases it may decrease the uh, risk of avn and it's a simple procedure if done uh, anteriorly through a, a small incision or by a, by just aspirating it uh, aspirating the joint uh, hematoma by a white bore uh, needle it doesn't cause any risk so uh, most uh, surgeons believe that it has to be done in every case of close reduction and the type of fixation much has been uh, discussed about this uh, this aspect the general uh, thing is that we have to uh, compare i mean way bo- two aspects one is stability of the fracture and another is risk of fascial injury that's a new thing uh, which we have to consider in uh, important thing which we have to consider in children when we cross the implants uh, cross the fascias with implants there is a high risk of fascial injury so which is more important is it the fascias or the stability the again the the uh, consensus is that stability is more important i have put it in big letters <laughs> to indicate that because the the problems of the complications of a uh, uh, um, violating a fascias are easily treatable compared to those of the uh, lack of stability like non union uh, the mal union as well as avian and again we have to when while uh, thinking about a type of fixation we have to uh, consider the delbert type as well as age of the child in uh, children less than 10 years it is preferred that we do not cross the fascias with implants in those children we have to always uh, use we ha- we can uh, resort to fascial sparing fixation methods like smooth uh uh you know, pins like airways and uh, the 
older implants like uh, nerve spin, more spin, etc. And again, placing the screws, uh, the screw tip just short of the physis, not crossing it. And transfacial screws, it should be ideally placed five millimeter away from the subcontral bone. And uh, always avoid the the common mistakes are putting it posteriorly, perforating the posterior cortex of the neck and the uh, epiphysis with the uh, with the screw and also placement of the screw in the anterolateral uh, quadrant of the head because it causes vascular injury and uh, according to fracture type the the stabilization methods are uh, given described well in the literature and the the general uh, thing is that less than 2 years we do not use any metallic implants just uh, a hip spike out is uh, enough and at an age of 10 years or older we can violate the physis we can put transvacial fixation methods and in delbert type 1 we can use uh, transvacial screws and 2 to 9 years smooth pins two smooth pins two caves should be used but this is not a very very uh, strong fixation method so we have to supplement it with a spiker hip spiker and again delbert type 2 and 3 less than 2 years hip spiker 2 to 9 years smooth pins can be used again and physial uh, physis sparing screws especially when there are there is adequate metaphysial bone to hold uh, uh, screw threads we can use physial uh, 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 sparing screws but uh, again uh, it's not a very strong fixation method we have to supplement it with a spiker usually the screws which are used are cannulated cancellous screws uh, we may have to use forum cancellous screws uh, sometimes for older children we can use uh, uh, six mm also <laughs> And uh, for more than 10 years, transvacial screws can be used. For unstable fracture patterns, like vertical fracture, comminated fractures, we have to, we may have to use a uh, plate and uh, side plate and uh, head screw construct because the screws tend to fail. Delbert type 4, again, less than 2 years, keeps spike up. 2 to 9 years, we have to use uh, the physial sparing fixation in the form of pediatric just uh, like I, I told the side plate and the head screw construct Pedia uh, pediatric dhs plate plate proximal femoral lcp uh, and uh, sometimes scanlated screws also for very stable uh, uh, fracture patterns and again if you feel that the fixation is uh, uh, is uh, weaker we can uh, put a hip spike up Children more than 10 years, we can uh, cross the uh, uh, physis with the head screw. And postoperatively, uh, hip spica cast should be put depending upon the type of fracture, the age. For younger children, there is less bone for the uh, to hold a screw or any other uh, form of fixation device. So we have to put, uh, uh, we may have to put a hip spica. Again, they tolerate uh, spica cast better. And uh, again, depending upon the quality of fixation and quality of bone, and the more important thing is complaints of the patient and the family. So, depending upon all these things, we have to put a hip spike up. And for stable fracture patterns uh, and with the transvisal fixation, no spike is needed. Some of the Western papers they describe uh, toe touch weight, but they permit uh, the surgeons permit toe touch weight bearing with crutches. But uh, a safer method is using it, uh, uh, keeping the uh, those children non weight bearing with a knee knee immobilizer, which keeps the knee as well as uh, hip in extension. And a close radiological follow up is needed to detect fracture displacement and implant failures early. Immobilization or restricted weight bearing has to be continued for six to eight weeks or till fracture union. And some surgeons they use uh, primary valgus osteotomy, especially in case of uh, uh, late presenting fractures and for vertical fracture patterns like uh, those with uh, high power angle. 
and the advantages are it converts shear forces into compression forces and it increases stability at the fracture site of the fracture and the the healing of the osteotomy it increases blood supply at the primary fracture site so it it helps in the fracture healing now uh, coming to the complications there are a lot of complications but i am considering uh, uh, four more common most common complications avascular necrosis of the femoral head non union coxa vara and premature facial closure avian of the femoral head it is the most common and dreaded complication with a rate of around up to 30% uh, in case of operated cases and it is usually diagnosed within one year but it it, it is been reported up to 3 years the cause could be primary trauma or caused by the surgical procedure and uh, literature uh, proven uh, associations uh, are between fracture displacement as the displacement increases in, there is increased rate of avian and albert type 1 and 2 shows uh, much higher rate of uh, avian and age also as age increases there is increased rate of avian and less uh, uh, healing healing potential so overall uh, there is uh, increased uh, there is worse prognosis uh, of when when a child uh, sustains a fracture neck of femur beyond 12 to uh, 12 years and here you can see as we go down the delbert classification the rate of avian decreases and that is the radleaf classification uh, which uh, classifies the the post traumatic avian in, uh, in pediatric neck of femur and the treatment of uh, avian in early stage involves anti inflammatory medications physiotherapy to improve the hip range of movement and limitation of uh, 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 sports activities high uh, impact activities and non weight bearing keeping the child non weight bearing for prolonged periods up to one year and all and in case of established avascular necrosis there is no effective treatment we can try out bisphosphonates uh, bone morphogenic protein core decompression vascular vascularized fibular grafting but finally uh, it will result in an uh, usually results in a, an early total hip arthroplasty coxa vara is the second most common complication it it uh, is seen in 18% of children it is defined as an exact angle of less than 120 degrees in in smaller children in younger children we can uh, correct it doing a trochanteric epiphysiotomy less than 8 years but in older children it needs a valgus osteotomy non union is seen in 10% of uh, uh, fracture neck of femur cases in children and it is defined as failure of fracture healing within Uh, six months. It is most commonly seen in type two or uh, delbert fractures. Due to uh, it could be due to non-anatomical reduction or inadequate fixation. Coxa vara is commonly associated with non-union, and uh, uh, the the procedure of choice to uh, improve union is valgus osteotomy. And some surgeons even try a, a, a fibular strut grafting or vascularized fibular grafting or or uh, other pedicle grafts to improve the vascularity and premature facial closure it is reported uh, from 20 to 62 percent a very wide range because uh, in 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 many many series it is not reported at all because it doesn't cause much serious symptoms as compared to other complications and the mechanism of facial injury could be direct trauma to the growth plate or va- secondary to a vascular insult or it could be iatrogenic crossing the physis with implants and proximal femoral physis uh, grows about 4 mm every year so this much of shortening can happen if the physis is totally damaged uh, every year this much of shortening can happen or uh, if if only one part of the physis is damaged it can lead on to uh, either varus or uh, valgus deformity and that much about the primary uh, uh, fr- uh, the post traumatic fractures now coming uh, a short note on pathological fractures they uh, often follow trivial or uh, no trauma secondary to bone cysts abc or uh, uh, 
uh, SBC, fibrous dysplasia, and osteomyelitis. Uh, they mostly need open reduction for clearing the pathological tissue and to collect the uh, uh, tissue samples for histopathological examination. And stress fractures, they are seen in uh, young athletes due to repetitive trauma. It may not be seen visible very well in an X-ray. Uh, it needs uh, usually CT or MRI for uh, advanced imaging for diagnosing it. Uh, it the treatment involves rust, analgesics, avoidance of painful activity, and sometimes for non-compliant patients, we uh, the surgeons some surgeons use hip spike also. So with that, I come to end of my talk. Thank you for your uh, patient listen. Thank you, Dr. Srijit, for the nice presentations. It is open for discussion. If any of the participants or the faculty have some questions to Dr. Srijit, please go on. Dr. Srijit, I had a doubt. Yes. Yes. For Delbit 1B, that is with dislocation. Yes. Uh, which is your approach? No, it depends on the, the CT. Uh, uh, the result. It's a very rare injury. I, uh, uh, I mean, I have not seen that yet. But uh, the literature says it depends on the uh, the position of the fragment. If it is anterior, anterior approach, uh, we we have to open it wherever the fragment is. Thank you. There are no more questions. We will go on to the next topic. I welcome Dr. Murugan for his talk on arthroplasty options in fractures of the neck of him. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank, uh, first of all, I thank KOA and the MTOC, especially Dr. Murali Krishna and Dr. Zorji for giving me the opportunity. So, I will be talking on the arthroplasty options. My, uh, my screen visible. Yeah, yes. So, arthroplasty options in several neck fractures. So, we all uh, heard about the pediatric neck fractures and the uh, trauma in, in patients and how come to the latter half of life. The neck of femur fractures. So, we will be dealing with the uh, neck in the elderly people. I am telling when to do an arthroplasty. And if you're doing an arthroplasty, will you do go for a hemi or a total hip arthroplasty? And if hemi, a unipolar or a bipolar arthroplasty. And uh, the surgical approaches, we all do the postural lateral approach, the lateral approach, and the and uh, and uh, some people do the candy approach. And the type of stem. So most of us use the cemented stem, and some use uncemented stem. So what is the the evidence, the literature evidence? So basically, this is a Literature review. So we all do, we all know. And uh, what is the literature, current literature practice? So that is what we are dealing in the next 10 minutes. So first, when to do an arthroplasty. So for that, uh, you see this paper in 2014. It's a AOS paper in 2014. And you look in the right-hand side of the slide. So if the, with poor bone quality, high degree of combination, and age is more than 65 years, it is not clear whether uh, the, if the patient has got less than 65 with poor bone quality and degree of combination, whether you can go for uh, arthroplasty. But general dictum is if it is less more than 65, you can go for arthroplasty. And if the acetabular soft portion is involved, you need to go for a total hip arthroplasty. Then, but see this paper, this one is the, uh, the um, recent one. The, the, 2022 20 October. So this is the new practice guideline. Here uh, you can see that the highlighted portion, the lower age limit for the patient population was set at 55 years, but was also required to have a median age of 65 years. That means the median age is still 65, but you need to consider people below 55 also for arthroplasty. So next is so you decided on arthroplasty if the patient is above 65 and whether to go for a hemi or a total hip arthroplasty. For that also, if you look into the literature, there are different, more than 100 papers are there in, the, in comparison between hemi arthroplasty and uh, total hip arthroplasty. 
but these are the i think these are the three major journals we usually uh, take into consideration for the journal of arthroplasty this was um, published in 2090 and uh, their paper they conclude that it's a meta analysis and they conclude that only arthroplasty appears superior compared to hemi arthroplasty and uh, that should be considered if the life expectancy is more than 4 years but if you come to this this the the, the, the same guideline in october 2022 and they said so these are the recommendations and if you look into the second one the unstable femoral neck fractures and i will highlight it so the enlarge it the improperly selected patients with unstable femoral neck fractures there may be a functional benefit to thc over hemiarthroplasty at the risk of increasing complication so you can do it it's a probably a bit of um, advantage is there but uh, in the same way there is increasing complication that's all and more important that the, the important is the recommendation they have the recommendation is moderate they have actually downgraded the recommendation from uh so advisable to moderate so they have one level they have downgraded in the 2022 uh, recommendations uh, regarding total hip arthroplasty and this jbj's paper this also i think it's 2020 and uh, they concluded the best evidence showed with moderate certainty that hemi arthroplasty and total hip arthroplasty likely result in similar similar revision rate function mortality periprosthetic fracture and dislocation up to 5 years so you can consider hemi arthroplasty in if the patient is above 65 years coming to the surgical approach so the posterolateral approach and lateral approach and the direct anterior approach so we will consider one by one the posterior approach in display the one point is one is in the displaced fractures the trochanter may be shifted slightly anterior and uh, if you put it in a slightly posterior that would be good and that will uh, uh, so your access to the joint would be easy and then you need to have a meticulous closure to prevent dislocation and again uh, looking at the literature the posterior approach okay for hemiarthroplasty uh, there is no evident advantage of posterior approach over lateral approach and anterior approach and this paper is the hip uh, Uh, symposium and uh, there are more dislocation but the less walking issue the limb will be less and uh, the patient will be comfortable but chance of more dislocations are there the another paper uh, comparing direct anterior approach with uh, posterior approach and uh, they, they concluded that direct anterior approach provides superior early function mobility compared to other surgical approaches direct anterior approach is associated with significantly lower rate of dislocation and compared with posterior capsular approaches but the only problem is the learning curve in direct anterior approach and also you need the specialized tables but some surgeons are doing with routine tables but the access and, and especially uh, rasping the femoral uh, uh, the canal it will be slightly difficult and the learning curve is high and you need a good uh, assistance and tractors for the a proper doing of the retentive approach otherwise this is considered as the best approach in neck of femur fractures followed by this having a lateral approach and finally the posterior approach even though we all do this posterior approach chance of dislocation is high the lateral approach was really no risk of posterior instability and therefore patient do not need any hip precautions and this probably could be considered as the approach of choice in dependent and neurological sort of patients but as we all know the chance of post op limp is there due to the abductor mechanism involvement coming to uh, the this another question unipolar or bipolar most of us use this bipolar implant because that is commercially um, mainly available in our market but if we look into the literature again this latest recommendation from aa is uh, in patient with unstable femoral neck fractures unipolar or bipolar hemiarthroplasty can be equally beneficial and all almost all the papers say that there is no difference between these two be unipolar and bipolar and here also this journal of arthroplasty there was no difference for revision mortality infection dislocation in uni and bipolar the world journal of, of, of orthopedics say no significant difference and this is the only paper i could see bipolar hemiarthroplasty is associated with better range of motion lower rate of acetabular erosion and lower reoperation rates uh, 
but most of the papers say they both uni and by are of of same advantage coming to the cemented versus uncemented stems and again the long term in terms of long term survivorship the cemented implants so they in this paper this cr paper they compared bipolar cemented stem with the other stems and uh, uh, long term survivorship for the cemented stem is up to 20 years and beyond is very good and implant related complications are also less with cemented implants compared to cement less implants uh, here uh, the cemented group has better outcomes and lesser complications and they also suggest uh, cemented implants in elder people with uh, transgenic fever and this jama paper they have gone one step ahead in, uh, in this is a us paper they are uh, they uh, they found out that the us surgeons and uh, they are mainly doing uncemented stems nowadays and they are accept, they are they are getting more and more complications like aseptic loosening and these findings suggest that us surgeons should consider cemented fixation in the hemiatoplasty treatment of displaced femoral neck fractures in the absence of contraindication and they, actually the paper suggests them to do cemented uh, stems instead of doing uncemented steps so i learned about the cementing of the of fever so uh, here uh, in a neck of femur fracture especially in the old age we get usually the type c stem and uh, in some with type b and rarely only get this the type b stem and if at all you get that will be a disease stem like a bit of disease or some sclerotic bone diseases so most of the time you can put a cemented stem in this type of uh, femoral anatomy with morphology and uh, your idea is to get a cement a cemented stem like this on the left hand side you can see the uh, well centered implant with good cement mantle on both on all, all around so typically you need to get a 2 mm cement mantle in the distal portion of the implant and about 4 3 to 4 mm all around in the metaphyseal area so that is the ideal cement mantle you need to get after a good cementation so that you need to have uh a third generation technique so if possible use this because the porosity reduction of cement using that mixing and configuration is there and uh, my recommendation is that all, always always use this distal tem- uh, the femoral plug and if you think this is a cost consideration you can take a bond piece about 1 cm cubic uh, a bond piece uh, from the femoral head and even though you will take around 5 minutes for that you prepare it and bang it down up to the desired level so that that will help in adequate pressurization of the cement and more than that it will prevent distal migration of the cement i suppose uh, in case of rarely uh, in case if there is an infection or in case of any aseptic loosening gum taking this cement out so this if you don't put this uh, uh, cement the plug there this can go down because of the wide medullary cavity in especially in old age the cement can go down and the adequate pressurization amount be there and the removing the cement you need to take the, the, the extended trochanteric osteotomy has to extend further down to take out all the all the cement in case the infection comes so uh, you uh, spend around 4 uh, or 5 minutes for a distal plug Uh, from uh, a bone plug from the femoral head and place it there and if possible uh, use this pulse lavage system so this remove the blood and fat cell from the cancellous bone and a good uh, so this will give a good bed and uh, you have, will get a good interdigitation of the cement into the cancellous bone and insertion is through the gun that also um, the the financial aspect is there but if possible you use, use this cement gun and if you use this a retrograde filling of the cement of the cavity you need to put a, a suction tube into the the canal to suck out the blood uh, uh, when the cement gets filled up this is a proximal pressurizer that also will help in good uh, interdigitation into the cement and with good pressurization and another thing this also these are all uh, the problem is cause but if possible use these things the centralizer that also give you a good uh, cement mantle in between uh, in uh, all around the stem and that also give you a good stability of the implant 
and while uh, during cementing is better always always is make a dictum that you inform the anesthetist because most of the time especially uh, very old patients the blood pressure can go down and cardiac issues can occur so you just to say the anesthetist that they am going to put the cement there and uh, uh, always um, adequate the, adequately hydrate the patient before taking the patient to the theater Uh, because the perioperative mortality after hemiarthroplasty related fixation in this paper the bone cement implantation syndrome they have highlighted with hypotension hypoxemia and cardiac arrest the prevailing theory is that the embolism of fat marrow contents bone and some degree of methyl methylate can go into the lung and produce this hypoxemic issues so uh, these are uh, about the uh, the technical and the uh, literature side so why you need to have a very good uh, uh, implant the uh, prosthetic joint so you need to have an immediate uh, result because you need you have to make the patient sit as early as possible to prevent uh, fracture disease uh, fracture related issues and in the intermediate term you need to make the patient walk without any limp and without any pain long term you need to have a long lasting uh, stem the implant should outlive the the person so uh, for that if you look into the uh, again the literature the cement uh, the austin mode process is out and uh, the cement and any other plasty unipolar or bipolar you can do and totally part of plasty in uh, active older patient and also in around two time so you are right so okay for perfection uh, uh for the, uh, the perfection of the joint you need to think about the complications uh so you you consider consider these things in your mind uh to prevent the complication the periprosthetic fractures can occur in uh, in, uh, in arthroplasty of the hip so especially that is more common with uncemented stem and also a, a, even a, in trial reduction you are planning a cemented stem and if you put a uh trial stem and uh, you try to reduce if this if the implant the trial stem if it is loose that will rotate inside the femoral canal and can produce a prosthetic the intraoperative fracture so be careful especially in your prosthetic bone uh, to prevent very prosthetic fracture the dislocation can occur uh, any time uh, so that is usually because of the issue of on uh, the the approach that all we already dealt with the prosthetic approach has got more dislocation chance and also the version and uh, the, the you should keep the the implant in the correct version to provoke the avoid dislocation the femoral loosening uh, so for that uh, we we think we have covered very well the cementing techniques uh, to avoid femoral loosening and infection uh, the meticulous uh, infection control and uh, the uh, most of the patients the old age patients will have their issues like the urinary issues the lung issues and uh, bed sore or some patient may report to you very late with bed sores and all so you keep a watch on all these things and give adequate infect infection control measures to uh, get away from that or the part part and can the acetabular erosion the erosions can be due to different issues we will just go through the causes one is the neck length the neck length uh, during the surgery if it is excessively long a uh, reduction may be difficult and pressure on the acetabular cartilage is increased and that can um, lead to acetabular erosion so your idea is to usually what we do is the distance between the greater trochanter and the center of the femoral head is restored that is what we usually do but the problem can arise uh, you uh, think about these three uh, situations one is the proxa rara where the uh, neck shaft angle is less than 120 and in proxa vaga is more than 135 degrees but most of us use this a mono block this is a mode even though it is mode like it's a mono mono block thing and the neck length is all, uh, always it's a fixed one so if you put this implant in the proxa vaga case so what will happen so if you so if you take a conventional cut like um, one uh, one finger breadth or 1.5 cm above the receptor canter as the conventional teaching and put this implant if you put this implant there definitely the limb will be longer and there will be a certain amount of erosion so in such cases you need to cut a lower neck cut and you need to uh, sink the implant a bit uh, to get the you know, the the native anatomy of the 
him so that limb limb will be restored and the acetabular blood pressure will be less and the same thing happens in a coxa valga uh, here if the angle is more than 140 degrees and these these things comes only if you are using a mono block uh, uh, implant that is available in our market so if you are using a modular implant you can have the various uh, options like the neck the neck shaft angle and uh, various offset uh, stems are available and uh, you can sink the stem little bit and you can put the plus minus plus or uh, neutral heads so i'm talking about just the implants that are available in our market and most of us are using that in here in coxa uh, valga you need to have a high neck cut uh, and uh, you can use uh, standard implants and also you can keep the stem a little proud uh, to get the correct limb length and uh, another issue with this uh, stabular rot neck the femoral head size so if the femoral head size if it is too large there could be an equatorial contact and that lead to a tight joint with a decrease in motion and pain and if it is too small the contact become polar that also leads to erosion supramedial prosthetic migraine and pain so uh, this paper uh, um, describes uh, the various instruments used to measure the head so we all have this i think the full circle with the, in our instrument set so you always use the full circle to measure the femoral head so that you will be correct on all all 99% of the cases so coming to the conclusion so arthroplasty is the preferred treatment of choice in neck of femur fractures above 65 years and uh, it can also do consider at least the severely osteoporotic bones and in severe combination uh, doing a hemi arthroplasty tha has only minimal advantage over hemi arthroplasty but carries high rate of complications and tha and hemi arthroplasty likely result in similar revision rate function mortality periprosthetic fracture and dislocation cemented hemi arthroplasty results in more blood loss and takes more operative time but is associated with less cost of treatment pain and complications and better functional outcome bipolar hemiarthroplasty is no way superior to unipolar as per most of the long term studies thank you thank you dr morgan for the wonderful presentation i think it's open for discussion we are uh, we'll take one or two questions quickly Morgan, you can stop sharing your screen. Oh, okay, okay, just a minute. Morgan, sir, just one yes. small question. Uh, yes. Very beautiful presentation, sir. Uh, you talked about equatorial contact and polar contact. Many a time we end up with either equatorial or polar because all the companies have only odd sizes or even yes. sizes. So, yes, yes, sir. to solve the problem <laughs> so i might uh, take is i always use the if if it comes to 42 i use 43 and uh, so that is my uh, i started from my career on because uh, if you put a lower one there is a polar contact and chance of minimal dislocation is there because the probable head size is less just in case of a recurrent dislocation of the shoulder the heel sag lesion comes there is high chance of again going the shoulder going into dislocation that was in my mind at the time when i uh, <laughs> when i opted for a higher size so i always use the higher size if the in between size comes that is my uh, my uh, routine thing. in your experience what is your uh, um, ratio of using a cemented versus uncemented stem in a pediat- geriatric uh, neck of femur and uh, uh, do you do you err on the plus neck or the zero neck when you have a in between um, stability while reduction yeah and uh, for your first question uh, 99% of the time in uh, hemiarthroplasty i use this cemented uh, implants and uh, one or two occasions probably less than five in my entire career i have used this uh, uncemented stem because of two reasons one the bone quality of the patient was very good second the anesthetist told me that it's a very difficult case and uh, there are cardiac issues and all if you put the cement there will be definitely the patient will go into shock and probably you may lose the patient in the table itself so in that case also 
I use Nancy Minutes still. And uh, uh, other like, so we uh, used to put this cemented uh, implants available in our market without step, without uh, putting cement. So if you get a very good purchase also, uh, you uh, get away with the cemented step. But in practice, only uh, very minimal, uh, very, very, very few times, like uh, very good bond stroke and uh, cardiac issues. That are the two occasions that I use and similar stuff. And uh, regarding the second part, the, the plus zero head that for that I always template. You take a very good quality pelvis X-ray and uh, and uh, assess the opposite side. And uh, see the, 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 the center of the femoral head from the trochanteric region. And if you can recreate it with a zero head, you use that. And if you want to put a plus head, you use that. That is my take. Thank you, Murian. That was a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you President. <laughs> okay. Matthew? Yes, sir. Any concluding remarks? Murugan, just one thought. Your THR, <laughs> which term do you use more? Uh, for THR. For THR. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the time I use unsimilar services. <laughs> Uh, the patients coming to so we recently took a um, uh, the data collected the data and uh, um, surprisingly most of our patients are below 55 years around 70 percent of people i don't know why so we're coming for thr are young patients so we tend to use one quality is better yeah. one quality better but it's not a so if you go through the literature there is no uh, way this unseminate stem is superior to seminate stem. Recently, one month back, I did a... Cost is also more. Stem. Yeah, cost is more. Cost so, is by more. that way, it's in a 21-year-old girl. And I used seminate stem in that case because, because I fully fused the hip with ankylosing spondylitis. The child was not... The young lady was not able to sit. So, in that case, uh, uh, the issue... the Probably the issue of version was there and I use the cemented step. So that is the advantage of using a cemented step. You can you have control over the version. The papers which was uh, supporting the uncemented stem, the, the main suggestion was that when it incorporates, when the bony incorporation occurs, the hold is really good. The stability is much more with uncemented stems because the future cost of loosening will be more with cemented stems rather than in uncemented stems. Your take on that? <laughs> Uh, the, I'm not, I don't think so because uh, the, if you uh, so there are uh, different papers coming in different directions and uh, in uh, so if you go in the US papers in the in the United States most of the surgeons prefer unsimilar stems and in most of the Swedish registry and the European registry those people go for similar stems and the Australian industry is mixed up so so the, the different uh, people say they have got good results. So, in more than 20, 25 years, seminate stems are lasting very well. But in also in unseminate stems, if there is any proximal loosening or any lysis occurs, even a bit of uh, contact at the uh, the lower portion, the, the implant removal will be very difficult in in revision. So there are issues. So I don't know. I I cannot comment on that. I'm not <laughs> that much experience. No, no, I just want to clarify because uh, a lot of ah. unsimilar terms are now available in the market. So I just put it on discussion, that's all. The thing is, my feeling is that the it's not just putting one word as cementing. It is how you do the cementing is very important. Exactly. If you do a very, very good cementing, even 25, 30 years, it will stay like that. Correct. You have to use all the methods to get a good cement. You have to take time to prepare the canal, wash it, put a plug, and then cement, as uh, Morgan has mentioned, use a cement gun, pressurize it, and then put the stem. If you do all these things, you will get equally or better result with cementing. Yes, correct. Yes. I also absolutely support uh, uh, emotion for that. Uh, the most important thing is how you do the cementing. Yes. That, that that's the most important. 
Iya. Yes. Oke. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, 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 most of the uh, colleagues here are usually the positive approach or hardinge approach. I am basically a hardinge uh, approach guy. Uh, what we find is most of the time the impact how to reduce the impact of that is there any 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 uh, technique by which you uh, how you take the incision or how you cut the uh, lateral abductor to prevent or to lessen the abductor loss so any, the any technique you keep deviation from the normal no most of the time you keep the uh, so the modified approach you keep most of the abductors in the gt and try to preserve the gt and those two third fibers that 66% of the fibers without injury so you need to have a very good bond lever so i usually put a spiked bond lever here the uh, in between the attachment of the uh, the gluteus medius and the gt so that you won't uh, injure the the fibers of the gluteus medius while grasping the or broaching the femoral canal so the, i think that is the most important portion so uh, avoid injury to the uh, gluteus medius muscle and i usually uh, so am i am i am a basically a posterior hip surgeon so i usually do posterior approach and uh, with meticulous closure of the posterior approach posterior capsule and the 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 piriformis and the short lateral rotators into the gt and uh, uh, most of my patients won't complain of any limp so maybe a bit of limp will be there in the initial period but most of them will recover fast in 3 months time okay so your reference to the, okay your your reference for the i mean the uh, other question your reference for the hip the valgus or varus it is depends on the opposite neck i mean how the neck is placed right yes. so depending on that you you place the cut Uh, so if you are using a mono block you uh, the, you take the cut depending on the opposite hip so if you are using a modular implant you can uh, sink or keep the limb a little proud or you can use a uh, high offset stem to uh, vehicleize that okay okay hi dr murugan yes rajesh sir nice nice presentation ah thank you i just asked ah, a question Adi. ജിസ്റ്റ് <laughs> <laughs> in such cases whether the cement restrictor use it will increase the cement uh, reactions property means anesthetic related issues or uh, will you restrict the use of cement restrictor in such case no cement restrictor so the, i think the more than the cement restrictor the timing of cement application is now uh, somewhere related to the complications so if you keep if you put the cement after polymer after start of polymerization the uh, the polymerized molecules won't get into the the into the circulation so if you if you introduce the cement very early probably that can go in so in that case also if you introduce it very early it will go into the canal so the okay. same thing can happen but the problem is if you are using a cement gun it has to apply little early otherwise it will be very difficult for you to introduce yeah, into the of the surgery canal so i don't think this distal plug will any way related to the the cement disease okay okay Now, rajesh as uh, murugan you. said the plug yeah. is not the factor which yeah. is going to decide it is the, the timing of mono- no it is a yeah. monomer the monomer, monomer. in the cement which creates the problem problem so okay, okay. Uh, there is what you call as a working time and all those things in cement uh, theory of the cementing so you use it okay. at the appropriate time and most importantly for the hip surgeries you use the low viscosity cement so that you get some more working cement. time okay. okay i'm just asking whether any study like that because 
the, the this permeation of the cement <coughs> material that can cause this uh, this polymer material can cause this reaction like a cardiac related issues so whether the restrictor can cause many problem because we are using it for a uh, for a short life span patient or a very high risk patient that's what just ask no yeah. i don't think you can study like you can not the uh, the life expectancy of a patient even though if the if they if the quality of the cementing is not good the implant can lose in the very next day itself yeah of the and the patient okay. has yeah. pain and dislocation and other thing so okay. even okay okay anthony yeah they will conclude sir georgi yeah Georgi or Matthew, concluding remarks? Georgi, yeah, Georgi is not there. Ah, yes. Georgi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, the respect members, first of all, I would like to thank KAO, KAO, especially President Dr. Ramakrishnan, uh, Secretary Dr. Anthony Topil, and uh, Treasurer Dr. Jijun Yaman, on behalf of MKOC, for giving this opportunity to conduct this webinar. Today, uh, we had an interesting talk and discussion on patch and echofema. So we in MKOC envisage this as a continuation of last webinar, that is the trochanteric fracture. So I thank the faculty members, uh, Sir, Dr. Raji P. V., Dr. Srijit P. Krishnan, and Dr. Murugan Sir for accepting our invitation and giving these excellent talks. Also, I would like to thank uh, OPs and Arun for providing us the facilities for this Zoom meeting. So lastly, thank you all for participating in this Zoom now. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good night. night all. Thank you. See you in hell. Yeah, hello. Cricket number one, Anthony. Yeah, cricket. Okay, okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Recording stop.